probably were wondering what in the world the um, Mayflower Society has to do with uh, the Yamhill County Historical Society, which after all um, seeks to preserve, protect, and share uh, the history and heritage of Yamhill County with others. Well, I got to thinking about it, and I realized there are probably several things. Uh, the, the most obvious is um, that we share a, a, this, a very similar mission. Our subjects may be different, but our objects are, are the same. That is, the Mayflower Society also is trying to preserve and protect uh, the heritage of, of the Mayflower Pilgrims. Um, the earliest settlers in Yamhill County were, of course, pioneers who left their homes, their f extended families, their, many of their friends, to travel westward to a land they had never seen to make a better life for themselves. The Mayflower Pilgrims did the same. Of course, they came across on the water. Uh, <clears throat> it was because these early Americans, or, or pioneers rather, lived in America, the land of the free, that they had the liberty to make the difficult choice to come westward and settle in the Yamhill Valley wilderness. In fact, it was the Mayflower Pilgrims who set the stage for such freedoms of, um, by drafting the America's first state paper, and that, of course, was the Mayflower Con Compact. Well, no doubt, some of the very early settlers uh, in Yamhill were Mayflower descendants. Um, I haven't researched that, but I think it's, it's pretty likely. Today, it's estimated that one in 10 Americans are descended from one or more of the Mayflower pilgrims. Um, and that uh, undoubtedly many of, of our residents in Yamhill County are, are uh, descendants of the Mayflower pilgrims, whether or not they know it. And I didn't know it myself that I was until about nine or 10 years ago and I discovered the fact by accident. Well, that begs the question, how many in this room think or know they are uh, descended from Mayflower pilgrims? Just a show of hands, okay. Do we want to say who real quick? Bravo, Mary Jo, and you're not even, you're only a, a, an in-law. <laughs> okay. We're, we're going to hear a little about William Brewster today. How, oh, we're going to hear something about John Howland, too. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, we're cousins. John, oh. <laughs> Oh, okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, Priscilla Mullins. I, I just love being descended from Priscilla Mullins and John Alden, yes. William Bradford. Aha, uh -huh. we're going to hear a little bit about Governor Bradford as well. Oh, <laughs> anybody else? You know, some of you probably are and don't know it, so, you know, we'll just hold that thought. Uh, well, what is the Mayflower Society, or the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, uh, as it's officially called, and why does it even exist? Well, contrary to the opinion of some, it does not exist for the glory of the Mayflower Descendants. Although, to be sure, we are proud of our heritage, as all of us should be proud of our individual heritage, uh, heritages. Um, no, the Mayflower Society exists to honor the memory of the Mayflower passengers and to keep the memory of them alive. One of the way that the Mayflower Society does that is through the printed word. Well, I was jolted awake during one of several sessions of the Mayflower Society's 39th 
Congress. I was uh, privileged to be a delegate, uh, an Oregon delegate at the 39th Congress in September and was held in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And you know how, how sessions can be. I mean, we had a wonderful time. We traveled around and, all, and saw sites, and you're going to get to see some of those pictures today. But um, you know, the sessions go on, and you know, your eyes get a little bit heavy. Uh, I was jolted awake uh, by uh, one of the speakers who said he had been a publisher of history texts for well over 30 years. And he said he has watched with dismay uh, that the, the amount of space devoted to Mayflower history has diminished. It's declined you know, all, every year, practically. And now it's, in many cases, the history books don't even include Mayflower history, or they're nothing more than a footnote. And he said, you know what happens to footnotes. They, too, disappear. Today, in Oregon schools, and well, schools across, across the country, the teaching of American history often begins about uh, 1760 or so, which is when 140 years after the landing of the Mayflower. Um, and so it goes without saying that um, the, the Mayflower uh, Society has our work cut out for us. Um, in this afternoon's slide presentation, you will see a bit about how the Mayflower descendants and everyone uh, who is, uh, loves history and is working on these projects is attempting to preserve the history of the Mayflower pilgrims. These pictures were taken by myself and my husband on our well, last two trips to Plymouth. We've only had two, uh, one in September and one in 2000 three or so. And then I threw in a few pictures of our England trip that was taken the year before, because after all, the saga of the pilgrims began in England. The story of the Mayflower Pilgrims is that of a small group of people whose passionate desire for freedom of worship, sense of justice, and love of liberty gave the bedrock values to the infant democracy we now call America. Their story began in 1607 on the east coast of England with a small group of religious nonconformists known as the separatists. By the 16th century, the Bible was being printed in English. And of course, this led to the inevitable. People who could read were now able to interpret the meaning of the scriptures for themselves. Reformation of the established church and the rise of Puritanism had begun. The Puritans, of course, wished to purify the church from within. The separatists, who by the way, were originally part of the Puritan movement, eventually began to feel that purification from within the church was impossible. They wanted to separate completely and form their own church. Thus, their name, the Separatists. Well, this was dangerous doctrine. In England, church attendance was required, and anyone not attending was likely to be arrested. Over time, many of the separatists were imprisoned, tortured, and hanged. The separatist movement took place far from the seats of church power in the little parish churches of the eastern shires. You notice that's not a great big cathedral, such as you see in London. We saw lots of those as we were traveling around, and it seems like every village has one. When, by royal decree, they were forbidden to worship as they believed, the separatists began meeting secretly in Scrooby Manor, 
home of elder william brewster within a year however their meetings were sadly discovered that is not scooby manor that uh, we didn't get to see scooby manor but that's a house of the period the scooby congregation realized they had three stark choices conform face imprisonment and possible execution or give up all they had in England, their homes, their belongings, and their livelihoods, and flee to Holland, where they believed they would find greater religious tolerance. And this is not one of their homes either. This is, um, although it is a home of the period, it happens to be Shakespeare's grandparents' home. It's, it's uh, the, the Mary Arden house where his mother was born and raised. The difficulty lay in the king's edict, which prevented dissenters from emigrating without permission. This is uh, over in Lavenham on the East Coast. And those, those, that's a very old hotel. Some of you have no doubt seen it. Um, it's made up of many or several houses and became a hotel some time ago. Okay. Is this better? Not so much. Can you hear me? Better? Is it better? Okay. After several terrifying failed attempts, imprisonment, and further persecution, the Scooby congregation did manage to escape to Holland. The weary band of separatists arrived in Amsterdam and later settled in the small university town of Leiden, where they remained for the next 11 years. Here, they were able to rebuild their lives in an atmosphere of relative tolerance. It was here that Elder Brewster wrote and published 15 to 20 books containing illegal religious free thinking and smuggled them back into England, imagine. King James demanded his arrest, and since this would lead to Brewster's probable execution, he was forced to go into hiding. About this time, after intense debate, the separatists decided to try to immigrate to America. They were able to work out an agreement with a group called the Merchant Adventurers, who were interested in seeing colonies established in the New World for trade and profit. King James was of similar mind, and he eventually granted the separatists permission to emigrate. Now, mind you, he didn't love them. He's just seeing dollar signs. Selling most of what they owned to buy the little ship Speedwell, 52 separatists sailed from Amsterdam to join a London group who had been recruited by the merchant adventurers, today we would call them venture capitalists, to round out the number of passengers needed for the voyage. Many of these people were not religious reformers and were setting out for the new world for other reasons. They came from towns and villages all over England. That, of course, is the Cotswolds. That's the Midlands. This is a, a darling village we visited in, in Suffolk on the east coast again. Um, another one of those little parish churches of the sort they would have attended. The merchant adventurers charted a ship called the Mayflower, a small ship of 180 tons, 90 feet long and 24 feet wide. That's not a big ship, although it was big for its type. The ship would sail under the able direction of Master Christopher Jones and uh, this gentleman uh, took us through. He, uh, he was quite wonderful, and he gave us a, a terrific tour. <clears throat> There's the captain's quarters, first mate's quarters. Now, mind you, the, this is nothing like what the passengers had. <laughs> Navigation device, I'm not sure how that, how that worked, but uh, I think some in this room probably do know. The two ships embarked from Southampton for America in July 1620, but not very far into their voyage, the Speedwell began taking on water and the ships had to put into Dartmouth for repairs. 
Again, the two ships set sail with the Speedwell once more, proving unseaworthy. This time, the two ships anchored at Plymouth Harbor, where it was decided that uh, the remaining passengers of the Speedwell would board the already overcrowded Mayflower. So the passengers of the Speedwell who just just decided they could not go on, uh, went back in uh, the leaky Speedwell. I guess they patched it up enough and went back to London and then I guess uh, finish, went back to, to Amsterdam. On September 6th, 1620, the Mayflower embarked for the third time, sailing much later in the year than originally intended. Because of this, the 102 Mayflower passengers would face equinoctial gales, fearsome storms, and a vicious sea ahead. Aboard were 50, that, that's, aboard were 50 adult men who were passengers, 19 adult women, three of whom were pregnant, and 33 children. Can you imagine 33 kids in that little ship? <laughs> In the midst of one great storm, John Howland was washed overboard, but he was miraculously rescued. Okay. The Mayflower passengers slept partially exposed on the lower deck in hammocks and bedding soaked with seawater. They used sailcloth blankets covered in animal fat or oil to make them more water but nevertheless, they were usually cold and wet. Sanitary provisions were very primitive, and they could bathe only with a bucket of salt water. And it, this, this is something that's aboard the Mayflower, too. They're trying to show the precious possessions, the few that they would have brought with them, an old chest, baby's cradle, it was a harrowing crossing for the passengers. During one severe storm, the main beam broke, which needed to be repaired, or the Mayflower would sink. At first, <clears throat> no one knew what to do. Then someone remembered that the pilgrims had brought with them a large wooden screw for use in building their houses. And so using this screw to repair the beam, the Mayflower passengers and its, uh, the Mayflower and its passenger were saved. And this is a this is Desire Minter, who's a young girl, and she was um, aboard the Mayflower too. Um, Desire didn't go back with the Mayflower. None of, none of them did, actually, just the crew. But um, she did go back a few years later. She's a, a young ward of Governor Carver. In the midst of all of this, Mistress Hopkins gave birth to a healthy baby boy who was named, appropriately enough, Oceanus. <laughs> Food aboard ship consisted of grains, cheese, fish, dried fruit, and salted meat. Soon the water was undrinkable, and the men, women, and children had only beer to drink for many weeks. And this shows some of the food they would have had, grains, dried legumes, dried fruit, hard bread, cheese, looks like they had some cinnamon. There was some animosity between the pilgrims and some of the crew who were annoyed by their constant Bible reading and hymn singing. One surly crew member threatened to throw them overboard. Still, there was only one death among the passengers on the crossing, that of a young servant named William Button, whose body was given up to the sea just before land was sighted at 8 o'clock a.m. or thereabouts, November 9th, 1620. And here's a picture of the uh, Mayflower II. You'll see several of those, and that's the exact replica. Um, of the Mayflower, and it's, of course, in Plymouth Harbor, Massachusetts. I'm sure many of you have seen it. We can only imagine the joy and relief among the Mayflower passengers when land was sighted. Master Jones realized, however, that they had blown off course and attempted to sail south towards Northern Virginia. We would call Northern Virginia New York today. But the shoals along the coast of Cape Cod were treacherous. And he decided 
to sail back up around to the tip of Cape Cod and lay anchor at what today is known as Provincetown. The problem was their charter was for Northern Virginia, not Cape Cod, and discord began among the passengers over what should be done. And there we are at Pilgrim Monument. I think that was erected in 1920, the 300th year birthday of their landing. And we did climb to the top of that. The day we were there, this is the first time we were there, and it wasn't so foggy. The second time we climbed, and it was completely fogged in, so we didn't have a very good view. But it's very interesting inside to climb up. Governor Carver, Elder Brewster, and other leaders realized that the group would need a firm foundation and structure if they were to survive. And so, in a remarkable stroke of genius and diplomacy, a document we now know as the Mayflower Compact was drafted. 41 adult male passengers were called into the captain's cabin and one after another signed their names to this covenant. America's first state paper. Winston Churchill called it, quote, one of the remarkable documents in history, a spontaneous covenant for political organization. In 1802, John Adams called the Mayflower Compact, quote, the foundation of the US Constitution in principle. It was undeniably the Mayflower Pilgrims' bravery their passionate desire for justice and freedom of worship, and their love of liberty, which set the stage for what would one day become the greatest nation in the world. And that bus relief is, is in Provincetown. Um, OK, I'm going to. I'm going to read this. This is the Mayflower Compact, and I think it, it's very short, but I think it bears reading once in a while. If I can just get it to. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof, to an act constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th Anno Domine, 1620. Well, soon after their arrival, 16 well-armed men from the Mayflower set out in a small boat to explore the coastline. And that is a shallop. That's their little, that's much like the little boat they would have um, explored the coastline with. The pilgrims were eager to find a suitable place for the colony to settle, but in the short term, they scouted for necessities such as firewood, fresh water, and game. And by the way, this and the following paintings are in Provincetown Museum. They discovered a fresh water spring and drank their first fresh sweet water in over two months. And that spring, by the way, is connected with the Pamet River. And I had to hop out and get this picture of the Pamet River as it looks today. While the men were exploring the Cape, the women, ha, wouldn't you know it, went ashore to wash clothes for the first time since their embarkation over two months before. But I am sure, uh-oh. This is not good. I'm 
I'm not looking at this, so if it needs to be adjusted again, let me know. Um, and that was since their embarkation two months before. Meanwhile, the men discovered a sandy hill whereupon they happened to find the remains of what appeared to be a white adult male and a blonde child. Nearby were buried several baskets of Indian seed corn. Now remember, um, there were white people fishing and exploring the coastline 100 years at least before the landing of the Mayflower. So um, it's, it's not surprising that there might have been a, a, a white man buried there with a blonde child. Today, there's a plaque on Cape Cod memorializing Corn Hill. And the hill has um, houses on it pretty much all over. While they were exploring Cape Cod, they had their first encounter with the Indians at a place now known as First Encounter Beach. From accounts of Indian massacres in Virginia, the pilgrims had cause to fear them. Likewise, the Indians had reason to mistrust the white men, and so gunshots and arrows were exchanged, but fortunately, no one was hurt. Little did they know that soon they would learn to trust each other and become friendly allies. Of course, I don't have my glasses on. So. Is that a little better? Okay. It's First Encounter Beach. It's just a long stretch of beach and a lot of that seagrass there. The Mayflower anchored off the tip of Cape Cod for about a month, but in December, the group concluded that Cape Cod was probably not the best place for their settlement, and they chose instead to begin building their homes across the bay at Plymouth. The men went ashore to begin work, but many of the passengers were falling desperately ill. Legend has it that the pilgrims first set foot on Plymouth Rock, and you can see it's been broken. That's what's left of it. It's been broken, uh, glued back together, uh, moved several times, and it may not be the first place the pilgrims stepped when they disembarked. However, it is viewed by the many who visit as a symbol of the pilgrims' courage and determination to secure freedom despite enormous hardship. During the first winter in Plymouth, many of the passengers and crew became so ill that many were dying. By the end of the first winter, nearly half of them had died of scurvy, respiratory infections, and pneumonia after half, about half of the Mayflower crew also died. And this, I know you can't read, but it's, what it's showing is that, um, the, well, the top half it shows the, the passengers who, who died the first winter, and the second half, those who survived the first, the first year. So you can see just about half of the, of the Mayflower passengers died. During the first winter, the pilgrims buried their dead in the very black of night so the Indians would not realize how weak they were in remaining numbers. The bones of four pilgrims are buried in the sarcophagus atop Coles Hill. And I will say that when we were, uh, when we were at the Congress, um, we had what we called the, the Pilgrim's Progress. And the first place we stopped was Coles Hill. Well, it happened, and it really just happened that that day was was September 11th, and down below at Plymouth Rock, there was a ceremony going on, and lots of people were there to commem commemorate the events of 9-11. And um, someone sang America the Beautiful very beautifully, and everyone joined in. And it was, as I say, there wasn't an, a dry eye on, on Coles Hill that day. So. There's a plaque. Amid the illness, death, and grief, the pilgrims' faith endured. During the first winter, the men succeeded in building one 20 by 20 common structure to house the pilgrims who remained alive. By the end of the first year, though, they had managed to put up seven houses along a lane called The Street. It was the only street. And this was, re later it was renamed Leiden Street, and Leiden Street still exists in the 
city of Plymouth today. The interiors were warmed by an open hearth and had hard earthen floors. That reenactor has been there a long time. You probably recognize him if you were there. <laughs> Much of the credit for the Plymouth Colony's survival belongs to William Bradford, who was governor of the Plymouth Colony almost continuously from 1621 until his death in 1657. Today, plaques showing the home sites of various Mayflower passengers can be seen along modern-day Leiden Street in Plymouth. Here was the home site of Governor William Bradford. And a few yards away uh, is the Plymouth home site of John Alden, Assistant Governor of Plymouth Colony for 50 years. He, too, is considered an important contributor to the founding of Plymouth Colony. Much of the credit for the survival of the remaining passengers must be given to the Wampanoag native peoples, not the least of whom was their chief, Massasoit. Massasoit was called the great protector and preserver of the pilgrims. Nonetheless, the pilgrims were aware that there were other people in this land who were not so friendly, and so they built a fort at the crest of what is now called Fort Hill. The lower level served as their meeting house, and the second floor was a fort defended with cannon. And by the way, there's a beautiful view from that fort uh, down to the ocean. After prayer, Captain Miles Standish regularly led the men of the colony through their military training. I'd like to point out the colorful clothing. Remember, the pilgrims um, had lived in um, Amsterdam, where there were beautiful, wonderful cloth and gorgeous dyes. So their clothing was really quite bright, and we often see depicted uh, the pilgrims in black, you know, dark. Um, black clothing and the white collars but and and buckles on their shoes but that didn't come into play until until much much later or well at least 10 years later with the with the puritans the pilgrims built their village in plymouth because the land was already cleared by the indians the soil seemed good and there was a good natural spring this is the town brook as it looks today not only did the river provide the pilgrims with fresh water, every year the river was rife with herring which spawned here, and they used the fish to fertilize their Indian seed corn, one of many things they learned from the Wampanoag. By harvest time of 1621, less than a year after they had arrived, the pilgrims had a harvest home celebration to rejoice over the abundance of the crops. Massasoit and about 90 of his warriors attended and helped augment the menu by bringing several deer to the three-day celebration. Thank goodness, with 90 guests. <laughs> Today we call this the first Thanksgiving, though in fact a form of Thanksgiving was celebrated earlier in Jamestown. In 1621, another ship, the Fortune, arrived bringing with it more colonists. And this was followed in close succession by the arrival of the Charity, the Swan, the Anne, and the Little James. By 1623, about 20 houses had been built in Plymouth, and by 1630, Plymouth Colony was flourishing. Three gossips? You know that wasn't pejorative in those days. I don't think it was. Uh, storing wood for the winter at Plymouth Plantation, and they really were. They used that wood in those houses for cooking and, or, or, and, and to keep warm, for sure. One of the women's chores at Plymouth was carrying water. Glad we don't have to do that today. <laughs> and we stayed. They almost had to shoo us out. Um, this was the end, and she's putting the chickens in for the night. There are several pictures of the interiors of these little houses, how they slept. Notice the lots of herbs for medicinal and cooking, airing the, they're airing their bedding. The 
pilgrims heated and cooked their food in open fireplaces. Well, these were quite dangerous, and periodically a spark from the fireplace or chimney would reach the thatched roof and set the house afire. Just last November, the Francis Cook House at Plymouth Plantation caught fire in this way during a cooking demonstration and burned to the ground. It was just right around Thanksgiving time. Fortunately, no one was hurt. You can see how easy it would be for those houses to catch fire, though. Mending clothes. I'm sure that the ladies did a lot of that. And that is was used to grind the Indian corn, which is very, very hard. So I'm sure the young boys would have gotten that chore. <laughs> Took a long time to grind Indian corn to meal. Three gossips again. They were fun to talk to. And of course, they never, ever leave character. They're just right in 1627. Sway back house. The colony's near neighbor and allies were the friendly Wampanoag tribe. It was the Wampanoag who taught the pilgrims how to ensure a good crop of Indian corn, how to grind it, and form it into nutritious meal. And they've left this open so we can see how, how they would have built their homes. I think that would have been a longhouse, individual dwelling. These native peoples showed them the means of survival in an unknown American wilderness. Although initially wary of each other, these two completely dissimilar societies soon became allies and lived for the next 50 years with great civility, friendship, and trust. Hollowed out canoe. These are descendants of the Wampanoag. There has been mixtures, of course, as there have been in, with all of us. She said she was making a, a soup, and she told me what was in it. And I don't remember everything, but it sounded delicious. I know it had wild berries and wild onions, and um, I think she said shrimp. And, and then along with that was um, a kind of a hasty pudding, or what we would cornmeal pudding. Darling Wampanoag child, having some soup. <laughs> I understand these houses were really quite comfortable inside. In, in 1626, an English ship, the Sparrowhawk, sailed for Virginia, but like the Mayflower, she was blown off course. Unfortunately, she ran aground on Cape Cod. After several anxious hours, the passengers and crew were rescued by the pilgrims and given shelter for the next nine months until they were able to continue on to Virginia. The hull was buried in the sand until 1862 when a storm uncovered it. So nothing's left of the Mayflower, but that's how the hull would look, except that's a, that really is a much smaller ship than the Mayflower was. For the first seven years, the pilgrims held their homes and farmlands in common according to the terms of their royal charter sent by King James. So you can imagine there were some, I won't say arguments, but probably some, some discussions about how to use the land. <laughs> then in 1627, eight of the Plymouth colonists undertook the burden of paying off the debt of the colony to the merchant adventurers. These included Isaac Allerton, William Bradford, Miles Standish, William Brewster, John Alden, Edward Winslow, John Howland, and Thomas Prince. They were known as the undertakers and would be reimbursed by the other colonists as they were able. And these are a couple of reenactors uh, portraying John Alden in the foreground and John Billington, who was by the way the first 
man to be executed in Plymouth Colony, but that was later. A replica of John Alden's house as we think it may have looked. Now, of course, he was the ship's cooper, and so he was handy with wood, and, and so his house had wooden tiles instead of thatch. But most of the houses were thatched. By the 1630s, food crop, crops were plentiful, and numerous houses were being built. The colony had become more prosperous through the trade with England, the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, of course, New York. And that's the interior of the house of Miles Standish, I think. Look at, uh -huh. <laughs> and some of the uh, earthenware that they would have brought with them, and a trencher. The pilgrims could now own land and homes and they could loan, own them individually. And this led, of course, to gradual changes in Plymouth Colony. Some of the Pilgrim families began moving away from Plymouth and found in settlements up and down the coast of Massachusetts. John Alden and Miles Standish both established homes in nearby Duxbury. This is the original home of uh, John Alden and Priscilla Mullins, built in 1657. Now, you can see it's had some facelifts. And when we were there in September, they just put on fresh cedar siding. The land and the house has always been owned by the Alden family and is now owned by the Alden kindred of America. So it's been in the hands of the same family for a long time. This is a rendering of John and Priscilla Alden <clears throat> as a young married couple in Plymouth. John originally served as the ship's cooper and Priscilla Mullins arrived on the Mayflower when she was about 17. But her father, mother, and brother all died the first winter. Miles Standish and John Alden continued to be active members of the Plymouth Colony until their deaths. So even though they were living in, in Duxbury, they both held offices and they went regularly to, to Plymouth Colony, or I mean Plymouth the town of Plymouth. The colony continued to grow and prosper, and in 1636, the first grist mill was built. John Jenny was the owner of the grist mill, and his operation made it easier to feed the growing population of Plymouth. The mill was also the beginning of industry and free market trade in America. And here's an actor portraying John Jenny, but he's not just an actor. He is a real miller, and that still is a working mill to this day. The Plymouth Colony contained about 300 residents in 1630 when Governor John Winthrop arrived with eight ships carrying about 1,000 passengers. These people, known as the Puritans, set to work establishing a nearby colony in Massachusetts Bay, where we know we know it as Boston, of course, today. Thousands more immigrants followed in, in what was the Great Migration. By 1640, the Massachusetts Bay Colony contained over 10,000 residents and soon overshadowed the population of Plymouth Colony. By 1692, Plymouth Colony was absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony. However, by this time, some of the original Mayflower passengers had sired numerous children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who would be the forebears of today's Mayflower descendants. And there's the stone of Edward Doty, Elder William Brewster, and that's those stones and many others are in Burial Hill in Plymouth. Some of the original Mayflower pilgrims are buried in the old burying ground of Duxbury. This is the gravestone of John Alden next to the site of the original meeting house. <clears throat> next to the Alden stone is a memorial of his wife, Priscilla. Also in the burying ground is the grave of Captain Miles Standish. And I would say that's just a little bit more militaristic. <laughs> 
Some of the Mayflower passengers eventually returned to live on Cape Cod, as did Joseph Rogers, who was a 13-year-old aboard the Mayflower. He's buried in Cove, burying ground in Cape Cod. Constance Hopkins was 14 at the time of the crossing, and she's also burying in Cove, burying ground. Also aboard the Mayflower was her 13-year-old brother, Giles Hopkins. His remains are also in Cove Bearing Ground. All of these original Mayflower pilgrims and others left descendants. A little over 100 years ago, some of the Mayflower descendants united to form a society to honor the pilgrims and to keep their memory alive. Today, it's called the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. The Mayflower Society House Museum, formerly called the Winslow House, serves as headquarters for the society. The house is located near Plymouth Rock, overlooking Plymouth Harbor, and is open in season for tours. Beautiful gardens surround the house. And while we were back there, um, they had for us, for the, those attending the Congress, a, a beautiful garden party. And, and there was a, oh, refreshments and, and, a and some chamber music players, and it was very nice. At the end of this walkway lies the Mayflower so Society Library, which is open to the public and contains rare books and other Mayflower-related documents. And by the way, I, I apologize. I did not get a picture of the library this time. Historical and genealogical researchers make use of the library and are continually uncovering new information about the lives and connections of the Mayflower passengers. Many people who are interested in pursuing membership in the Mayflower Society also make use of the library, and it's open all year long. Mayflower Society lineage papers are preserved here, copies of which can be requested through the state society historian. And so this is going inside. We're just going to look at a few rooms. This is the mahogany dining room in the Mayflower Society house and the library. It's also done in mahogany. Um, a keyboard instrument in the drawing room, a fireplace in the drawing room. And I was fascinated by the d details of the tile. Every one of those tiles were hand painted. It's not very clear, um, but they're beautiful. Um, the drawing room, one of several models of the Mayflower in the Society House, you can imagine. There'd be several. The house contains a large collection of antique china. Ralph Waldo Emerson and one of the daughters of the house were married here. Um, he married um, ja one of the Jackson daughters who owned the house at the time. And then looking out to the garden, and again, and a writing table of the period. Another one of several fireplaces. Of course, they needed those fireplaces to keep warm. More of the antique china. And a uh, nursery in the house. I love that old hobby horse. <laughs> Set tea and all set for tea. A rendering of Priscilla. Of course, we don't know what Priscilla looked like. We don't know what any of the Mayflower pilgrims looked like, except I think we know, I'm sure we know what Edward Winslow looks, looked like because he had his portrait done. And these rooms, this is, of course, a bedroom. These rooms are occasionally used by visiting Mayflower dignitaries. And there's a beautiful chair. It doesn't look very comfortable to me, though. <clears throat> well, how does somebody apply for membership in the Mayflower Society? And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but an application form may be obtained from our Oregon State Historian, and up to five of the earliest generations on the form will usually be filled in since these connections have been amply proven. Then it's up to you, the applicant, to prove your remaining generations. You mean the one, the five? Oops. Yes, yes, the, the, first, the first five. 
And so when the applicant is, has completed the form here, she sends it along with the necessary documentations to the state historian who reviews it and forwards it along with the application to the along with a fee to the historian general in Plymouth. And if approved, the applicant is granted membership in the General Society and automatically becomes a member of the Oregon State Mayflower Society. And we are going to end there. <laughs> Yes, questions, comments? Yes. It was, um, well, it was, of course, of a much later period, but it was um, owned by, the, by Edward Winslow, who had, had an interesting, I think, so he was, a, he was a descendant of the original Mayflower pilgrims, but because this is a, a later period, but it has an interesting history because he was on the wrong side during the Revolutionary War, and so at the end of the war, when his side didn't win, he was, um, he was, <laughs> he had to go to Canada. I, I think he went to Canada anywhere or England. Anyway, um, that house was later purchased by the, by the Mayflower descendants. It's gorgeous, and it's and it's open for tours. So I we visited before I ever became a member. Loved it. Any comments or questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, it happened in 1627 that they had the, the separation of the land, the division of land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I am here to talk with any of you who would like to, to talk to me about joining the Mayflow or how, how to go about doing your application, if you'd like to talk to me afterwards. Yes, those are the ones. There were, there were others that did not leave descendants. Either they died the first winter, or, or for whatever reason, didn't leave descendants. So it's not to say we're not going to find out that some others did someday. You know, there's constant research going on. Yes, uh, well, we do know the ages. Uh, Elder William Brewster was one of the oldest at, he was in his 50s. Um, they, they talked a lot about who would come on the Mayflower. You know, they thought others would come over later. But they, they were a little wary of sending children because they thought they might not survive, or women. And so there were only 19 women that came. Uh, but interestingly enough, it was the the younger people, the children particularly, that, that had the, the survival rate. No, well they think it might be because when food was scarce aboard ship, maybe the parents made sure the children had food. I don't know. Long, 90 feet long and 24 feet wide, 180 tons. So it wasn't a big ship. It, you, mo many of you may have been on the ship. I bet a lot of you have been there, huh? <laughs> okay, I'm through then. If anybody wants to talk to me after.